All right, so tonight we are going to continue going through 1 John, and I, I keep trying to do more than a couple verses at a time, but to keep it to a half hour, I don't know how to do that, so we're going to read three verses again tonight and just go and see where we get to. So if you want to grab your Bibles and go to 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 8. Tonight's topic is fun. I've actually never taught a message on this topic. <laughs> the topic tonight is sin, so this is great. All right, so 1 John chapter 1, we're looking at verse 8. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. So real basic from the beginning tonight, um, but there's so much to unpack in these few verses. So if you guys will trek along with me, we'll kind of be all over the Bible again, but hopefully we can learn some things tonight about what is the context of sin, what is the, what is the reason that um, John is saying that if we claim to be without sin, that we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us? And then what does it mean that if we confess our sin that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin? So let's pray and then we'll get started. God, thank you for another opportunity to open your word and to uh, just feed our souls from what you are speaking. I pray tonight that as I speak that your Holy Spirit would speak through me and that you would challenge us, that you would convict our hearts and that you would show us uh, the way towards you and the way towards grace so that we can live lives uh, that are passionately pursuing you. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, we talked about last week. I'm going to write this on the board right now. So we kind of have just a brief overview from last week because we started on this topic of sin and we talked about, I talked to a few people this week actually that watched online and they were like, I've never heard it taught that way and I'd love you to teach even deeper on this topic. So I'm not actually going to teach so much deeper on these four words tonight, but I will in the next few weeks. But these are the four words we talked about last week was that, um, sorry, it's not that way. It's the wrong word. Okay. That when we are tempted, we're talking from James chapter 1, verse 15, or verse 14 and 15. It says, um, so when you're tempted, that temptation leads to desire and desire leads to sin, and sin leads to death. So this right here, this series of events, that if we were to go around and just each of us share our personal stories here tonight, could probably all come up with places in our lives where we say, oh man, I was so tempted in that area of my life, and then I let my temptation turn to desire, and because I didn't have enough self-control or enough willpower or whatever it is, it, it turned into blatant sin, and sin turns to death. Kind of a funny illustration, but relevant, kind of. Um, I love ice cream. <laughs> and today I was working in the yard, and I thought I deserved some ice cream. And so we went to Culver's before I came here, because I was tempted, and my wife said that we should get something healthy. And I said, no, I think I want ice cream. And so I turned to a desire, and then the desire led to the sin of eating the ice cream. And if I keep eating ice cream, I will die. And so just kidding. All right, just trying to lighten the mood because we're talking about sin here tonight. But so temptation leads to desire, desire leads to sin, and sin leads to death. So this is kind of the context of what we're looking at tonight. Not all of this, but mainly around the issue of sin. We could teach a whole lot more around temptation, around desire, and then obviously around death, and we will in the coming weeks. But for this message tonight, we're looking at sin. And so sin has a lot of analogies to what it is. And don't get too scared right now because I'm not going to go around the room and point out everyone's sin, okay? It's not one of those messages where I'm telling you what your sin is. But we're talking about what is the root of sin? What makes us want to be people that sin? And then what, when we say that sin, what is that sin? So the, the, the most, I would say, um, generous and basic example of sin or definition of sin that I've ever been told is this. Sin equals, I'm left-handed, missing the mark. 
So if you think about it, you like that, John? Think about that in the, in the sense of like a bullseye. That what happens in our lives oftentimes, oh, that's a terrible bullseye, but you know. What happens in our lives is that the mark that we're going after is a life pursuing God. But what happens in our lives is we end up here, or we end up here, or we end up here, and we miss the bullseye, which is a life going after God. And what happens over here, this is where the desire and the temptation leads then outside, away from God's best for our lives. And so sin at the basic definition of sin is simply just missing the mark. And so when John's talking here in 1 John about sin, I want to go back to an Old Testament story at the beginning that kind of talks about the original sin and not the absolute original sin in Genesis chapter uh, 2 where Adam and Eve sinned, but go back to Genesis chapter 4. Because what I want us to understand tonight about sin is that sin has more to do with the condition of your heart than it has to do with what you do. And I think sometimes in the church, especially when we talk about sin, it's really trendy to point out people's sins or to call out the whatever the name brand sin of our generation is, right, and target that one sin and that sin. And it's easy for pastors to get up and talk about all the things they don't struggle with personally, but you, very, you have very few pastors that get up and talk about sins that they struggle with, right? It's easy for me to point at you and say, hey, I see this in your eye, but what does Paul say about that? He says, take the plank out of your own eye as you're trying to get the speck out of your brother's. And I always see it like having this great big four by four in my eye, and I'm trying to get your speck with my four by four. And so as I'm trying to get your speck, I'm knocking you out. And that's not doing anybody any good because we're obsessed over pointing out each other's sins. And at the end of the day, what sin comes down to is the attitude of your heart towards God. Not the attitude of your neighbor's heart, the attitude of your heart. So look at Genesis chapter 4. We'll look at the story about uh, Cain and Abel. We're going to read uh, most of Genesis chapter 4 here. It says that Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man, and later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain bought, or brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was angry and his face was downcast. Right here at the beginning of Genesis chapter 4, what we see with Cain and Abel is God had given them one instruction. And the instruction is that you bring the first of whatever you have. So if you have crops, you bring the first fruits of your crops. If you have cattle, you bring the first of your cattle. You don't bring God what's left over, you bring him what's first. And so right here at the beginning of time, Cain says, hey God, you're great, you're awesome, thanks for creating me, thanks for you know, bringing mom and dad, that whole thing, giving them clothes. But I'm gonna give you part of what I have. But I'm not going to give you what you told me to give you because that cost me too much. But his brother says, no, no way. I'm giving you the first because you called for the first and I'm going to give you what you asked for. And so right in the first few verses of Genesis chapter 4, we see the heart of Cain and Abel even before any action has happened. Because sin originates in our heart before the action actually happens. The desire and the temptation come before the sin actually happens. So keep reading on in chapter 4, starting at verse 6. It says, And the Lord said to Cain, why, <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm still recovering from last week. <clears throat> why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. That could be a whole message in itself in the fact that sin is chasing us down, telling us to come after it, telling us to miss the mark, telling us to be out in left field and be away from God's best and the purpose of God in our lives, which is to wholeheartedly pursue him. So our job is to master it. 
Verse 8, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Now there's the action, there's the sin. Murder was a sin. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Now he's lying. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Which is so crazy that Cain thought he could lie to God. Do you ever feel that way? Like, where you're just like, I, I was praying earlier today and God was telling me some instructions for the church. And some of the instructions he was giving me to do over the course of the next year and things that are going to cost me more. Like, not financially, but more time and more time in his presence and more study. And I, I, at one point while I was praying today, I just said to God, I was like, seriously, God? And I just heard him say back to me, seriously, DJ? Like, yeah. you know, like, like, you can't hide from me. So anyways, so he, he tries to hide from God, then he lies from God. So God comes in verse, um, well, the end of verse 9, he, God says, where is your brother? He says, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Which is a whole another side part right there, am I my brother's keeper, that God had created humanity from the beginning to be in relationship with God and in a relationship with each other. So yes, you are your brother's keeper, actually. You should, as his brother and as a fellow human being, he should have been looking out for the best interest of Abel, not his own best interest. Then the Lord said, what have you done? In verse 10, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which, is, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. Why? Because you didn't give me your first. If you give me your first, I'll bless everything else. But because you were out here in left field, now when you work the ground, it will no longer yield crops for you. You will be, rest, you will be a restless wanderer on the earth. We'll stop right there in, in chapter 4, but it goes on and Cain ends up walking outside and running off away because he's scared to tell his family that he killed his brother, and he's running from God and running from Adam and Eve, his parents. But the whole point of Cain's heart in this is that God desired the same for Cain and Abel from the beginning. What he desired for both of them was, here is how I'm telling you to live. And this is a thing for us to understand in Old Testament, which is so cool that we get to live on this side of the cross. And after just coming through Easter and realizing what the cross reconciled for us, because it used to be that they were under so much legal rules and regulations. The whole book of Leviticus came into play because God had to, because of situations like this, where, where Cain kills his brother, where Noah, like Noah is like the, the you know, the rescuer, right? He's, he's the guy that like saves the planet, him and his family, and he gets two of the animals of every kind, and God destroys the rest of the world, and he's like, I've used Noah, and Noah gets off the ark and builds an, an altar and gets stone drunk and curses God, like crazy. And then Lot, his nephew, I mean, generational, you can go into generational curses with sin. And Lot, his nephew, goes and, and gets stone drunk after something happens in his life and ends up sleeping with his daughters. Like, people were getting crazy. And so a lot of times we look at sin and we think about the law and, and legalism, and we think, why did God put all this stuff in the Bible? Why is Leviticus there? And why does so much of it not seem relevant to today's, today in 2017 and where we're at? And why doesn't it apply? And why can we read in Leviticus 18 and 19 where it tells us that if you eat seafood, basically, or red meat, you're sinning, and we go over and have a steak and talk about it, right? Because what God was doing was he was constantly progressing humanity closer to the cross, but along the way, they were blowing it over and over and over, and so he had to put some, some laws in place to say, here is what you have to do to obey me and to make the mark and to hit the bullseye. So in order for them to hit the bullseye in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, they would have to have hit every part of the law, and God knew that was impossible for them. That's why he invented sacrifice. That's why he said, bring me the first of what you have, and then I'll bless the rest. That's why he said, bring a lamb and lay down a lamb, and that will atone for you. So the beauty of Christ and this side of the cross when it comes to sin is that he's already paid the price for our sin, which is crazy. Yeah, he's already paid the price. So we don't have to figure out how not to sin and how to try harder and, and how to figure out how, how not to, how, yeah, when, 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 when desire comes and we give into temptation and then it leads to sin and it leads to death and we're just like, in, we're, we're a basket case. All we have to do 
is old school talking, plead the blood of Jesus, receive his grace, say, God, I need your redemption, I need your blood, and instantly we're cleansed. And so talking about sin on this side of the cross, honestly, it's so much easier for us. It really is. It's so much easier. But it still comes down to what it came down to at the very beginning of time, which is sin begins with an attitude of the heart. And where is your heart towards God? And are you going after what God has you going after? Or are you just trying to dodge and get where you can get and give God what's left over and give him what you know, that that whole thing? Which is crazy because if you look at Abel murdered his brother, but that wasn't his first sin. His first sin was not giving God his first fruits. But God cursed him not for murdering his brother, but for not giving his first fruits. And so we want to look at sin also in levels all the time, right? Well, that guy's a murderer, so he's way worse than me. I just gossip, right? No, God said, you didn't give me your first, whoa, hold on, wait, so I didn't give my Like, let's not talk about money, right? I didn't give my tithe, and I got more cursed than the murder? Like, that's crazy. No, it has nothing to do with money or murder. What it had to do was the attitude of his heart, because sin starts in our heart. So the question we're asking then is, what is sin? The actual dictionary definition of sin is just an immoral act considered to be a transgression against the divine law. An immoral act considered to be a transgression against a divine law. You could say there is sin in the eyes of God as what an immoral act would be is a sin in the eyes of God, basically sinning against God. Another definition of sin is um, to offend God, which that one's like, whoo, I don't really want to offend God. What, 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 is, what does that mean to offend God? But basically to go against what God has for your life. And so I'm going to read you guys a lot tonight. Um, I pulled from different commentaries for this because I am not an expert on sin. Okay, let me rephrase that. I am an expert on how to sin. I can teach you that one. But on how not to, I pulled some references uh, from some commentators who've been around a lot longer than me and uh, have studied this a lot more than I have. And uh, so I'm going to read through some of this commentary tonight about what is sin from the, the big question of what is sin, and then what is, what is sin from a biblical perspective, and then what is it when, when First John says that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Basically, when you repent of your sin, then what can we expect? So here we go. Don't mind me drinking water, because I didn't even have a voice yesterday, so I'm happy I can even talk. All right, so... Um, Big picture, we live in a culture where the concept of sin has become entangled in a legalistic argument over right and wrong. When many of us consider what sin is, we think of violations of the Ten Commandments, or we tend to think of murder or adultery as the major sins compared to lying or cursing, right? Anybody else feel that way? If I stub my toe, you know, throw an F-bomb out there, that's not as bad as cheating on my wife, right? No one agrees. Okay, good. That's, that's good. At least you don't agree. Cool. So the truth is that sin, as defined in the original translation of the Bible, means to miss the mark. The mark in this case is the standard of perfection established by God and evidenced by Jesus. Viewed in this light, it is clear that we are all sinners. If you want to look at Romans, we're going to go around a lot of verses through this too. Romans 20, or 3.23 just says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What I love about that verse is you can get stuck, and I think I preached about this a while ago, but you can get stuck on Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23, which both talk about all of sin and falling short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But you can miss verse 24, which says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I think that um, sometimes we focus so much on that 23rd verse that we don't go to the 24th verse and we're like, oh man, I'm way over here. No, you're not over here. You're here because Christ has already died for you. So right from, the, right from where we are, I was going to say at the beginning, we're already 20 minutes in. Oh, good grief. I got seven pages of notes and I'm on page one. Okay, so right from right now, we're under, we're under the new covenant. 
So as long as we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. So we're not having to worry about missing the mark because Jesus already made the mark for us. So that's Romans 3, 20, uh, 3 and 24. So in light of that, it does no good to compare ourselves to others. We cannot escape our failure to be righteous in our own strength. This is by God's design because only when we understand our, our weakness will we consider relying on the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Okay, so that's kind of big picture what is sin. So next question then is what is sin from a biblical perspective? Sin is mentioned hundreds of times in the Bible, starting with the original sin when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge. Often it seems as if sin is simply the violation of any of God's laws, including the Ten Commandments. Paul, however, puts it in perspective in Romans, if you're in Romans 3, go to verse 20, where he says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Isn't that interesting? So we don't become righteous by trying to observe the law. Do not taste, do not touch, do not, all, this, all the do nots, right? But rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. God wanted us to recognize our sins even though, or I'm sorry, even those who have not murdered or committed adultery or the big sins, as this commentator calls it, will find themselves convicted of lying or of worshiping false idols like wealth or power ahead of God. I think a lot in my life of, of sin issues, not the major sin issues, you know, like the things that, the major struggles we talk about, but I think often, like, am I, am I greedy? I, I live in a, in a country, I mean, I read statistics all the time because of the work we do in Africa, and it's crazy still, the, the 2015 statistic is that if you own one car, you have more wealth than 91% of the world. Only 9% of the world owns a car. Like, that to me is just staggering. And not that, I don't think I'm greedy for having a car, but where in my life am I missing the mark because my heart is not on God, my heart is on power or wealth or greed or false idols ahead of God. So tragically, sin in any amount will distance us from God. Listen to this verse from Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. We must resist the temptation to act as if we're righteous, especially by leaning on our own good works. And so I want to read you guys, I want to move forward a little bit here because we're, it, I always run out of time, but I want to make sure we pray tonight too. I want to fast forward here. So that's kind of what is the biblical definition of sin, what is sin. But I want to talk about this concept that I was reading today that I think was really eye-opening to me about sin and the cross. In, John, in 1 John 1, we read, he says that if we say we have no sin, we're liars and the truth is not in us. John introduced the idea of walking in the light and being cleansed from sin. But he did not for a moment believe that a Christian can be sinlessly perfect. To think this of ourselves, he says, is to deceive ourselves and to say to ourselves, to say this to ourselves is a lie and the truth is not in us. Our deceitful heart reveals, whew, <laughs> this is tough, our deceitful heart reveals an almost satanic shrewdness in self-deception. If you say you have no sin, you have achieved a fearful success and you have put out of your own eyes and I'm sorry and have put out your own eyes and perverted your own reason is what Charles Spurgeon says. Let me read that one more time. Our deceitful hearts reveal an almost satanic shrewdness and self and self deception. If you say you have no sin, you have achieved a fearful success. That's scary. And you have put out your own eyes and you have perverted your own reason. There are few people who think they are sinlessly perfect, yet not many think of themselves as sinners. 
So this is what I was studying this afternoon that really hit me in the world we live in. A lot of people would say, I'm bad, right? I make mistakes, I mess up. But we don't talk often about calling ourselves sinners. And this commentator goes on and he said, many will say I make mistakes or I'm not perfect or I'm only human, but usually they say such things to excuse or defend. This is different from knowing and admitting that you are a sinner. Why? Because sin is not the action. Sin is the state of your heart after God. And so anytime we miss the mark, we have to admit Whenever we say we don't have it all together, what we're saying is, I am a sinner in the eyes of God. And he says, to say that we have no sin puts us in a dangerous place because God's grace and mercy is extended to sinners, not to those who make mistakes or those who say I'm only human or no one is perfect, but sinners. We need to realize the victory and forgiveness that comes from saying I am a sinner, even a great sinner, but I have a Savior who cleanses me from all sins. Isn't that cool? Reading that this afternoon, that really convicted me because even in the way I preach and the way I talk to people, sin is not a trendy word, right? I mean, it's not. This is, it's not a word that we like to preach on much. It's not a word we want to talk about much. I always feel like if I preach about sin, then I probably need to air some of my own. <laughs> which doesn't help anybody, by the way. But like, you know, like, it's not something, because it's not like you don't leave church going, woohoo, like, I'm a sinner. Except, except, as I read this this afternoon, I thought, but I would if I truly believed that Christ died for sinners. So I do leave church feeling lifted because I know that I can lay it down in the altar and I can go home forgiven and free and victorious because he died for me. But I think what is happening, look at I stood up because I want to preach. Okay, I need to sit back down because we don't have time. But I think what happens and what's happening right now a lot of, in a lot of churches all over the place, and I do this all the time, so I'm not pointing fingers at any church. I'm pointing fingers at me, is we don't want to talk about sin because it's so, ugh, right? It hurts people. But what we're doing is we're actually deceiving people saying, well, it's just, it's just you know, you're just, you're, just, you're just a little bit jacked up. You're messed up. You know, you, you, didn't, you didn't do great there, but it's okay. No, God's grace didn't come for it's okay. His grace came for our sin, which is missing the mark because it separates us from God. Okay, so I'm going to sit back down because I can feel it. I don't want to preach, but I have two minutes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go a few minutes long tonight just so we know we're going to pray a little shorter. But I think this is important. Okay, so. Second part of that, of verse, uh, or verse 9 is then, if we confess our sins. He says, if we confess our sins. So we've, we've built the platform and realized, okay, sin is just missing the mark. Sin is me choosing anything but God. And as a sinner, I need to admit I am a sinner. So now is when the good news comes. He says, but if we confess our sins, though sin is present, it need not remain a hindrance to our relationship with God. We may find complete cleansing from all unrighteousness as we confess our sins. The word confess means to say the same as. When we confess our sin, we are willing to say and believe the same thing about our sin that God says about it. Jesus' story about the religious man and the sinner who prayed before God illustrates this in Luke chapter 18. The Pharisee bragged about how righteous he was, while the sinner said to God, be merciful to me, I am a sinner. The one who confessed his sin was the one who agreed with God about how bad he had been. Confession is, confess is a verb in the present tense. The meaning is that we should keep on confessing our sin instead of referring to a once for all confession of the sin at our conversion. You do not have to go to a certain place to continue confessing your sins. You don't have to do it when you're baptized or when you pray the sinner's prayer, but it's a constant daily reminder to yourself that I am a sinner but by God's grace, but admitting that and saying, God, I'm a sinner, forgive me of my sin. And that's when the blood of Jesus comes in and forgives you and purifies you. The next part of that verse, I'm going quick now, says he's faithful and just to forgive us. 
Because of Jesus' work, the righteousness of God is our friend, ensuring that we'll be forgiven because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. God is being faithful and just for, to forgive us in light of Jesus. How cool is that? Jesus came to, he said, no, I didn't come to abolish the law because what did we learn earlier? The law was not there to tell me how righteous I was. It was to give me an awareness of where I was broken. But he said, I came to fulfill the law, which means every broken piece that you see, I came to fulfill and reconcile you to God in spite of what you've done. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I think the big picture for tonight, and I'll try to wrap this up here. I could keep going. Um, I think the big picture for tonight is in talking about sin, and we're going to talk more about it next week when we go into 1 John chapter 2, but is the realization that sin is missing the mark, but also the realization that we have to admit that we have sin in our lives. And I'm saying that to you guys. I've been preaching for five years, and I can honestly stand here tonight and tell you that I don't know probably more than a handful of times that I've ever looked at a congregation of people and said that we have to admit we have sin in our lives. Why? Because it's way easier to tell people that they're messed up or they're missing the mark or, you know, make it trendier. But when I read that this afternoon and that, that quote from Spurgeon, I thought, whoa. Anytime that I tell someone, it's okay. You, you, you know, just, just, keep, just keep trying it out on your own strength. You'll do it. Just, 